The China Burma India Theatre is one of those that's criminally overlooked when we look at the wider history of the Second World War. The CBI, though, has some incredible tales, and one of the most amazing, the ones we're going to look at today, is Flying the Hump. Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bone. Caroline Alexander is a New York Times best-selling author, and her new book, which is this one, Skies of Thunder, the deadly World War II mission over the roof of the world, tackles flying the hump specifically. And Caroline in the past has looked at Shackleton's endurance, Captain Bly's the bounty. So in this book, she brings together lots of human tales to look at the men who flew over the Himalayas to supply Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist Chinese during the Second World War. There is a lot to cover in this book, and we delve into some of those elements in the episode that's about to follow. So, as always, we have to thank the fantastic team at the Pima Air and Space Museum for their continued support of the pod. If you like what you hear in this book and in this interview, head to Pima. They've got all the aircraft. They've got DAX C-47s to our American cousins, C-46 commanders, commandos, I don't like it, so I'm not going to worry too much about the name. See our previous pod with Adam Berry about our feelings on that one. But head to www.pimaair.org. They have got some fantastic stuff coming up across the summer. We spoke last time about the Build a Drone program. They have their Night Wings event coming up as well. And also the Pilot Exploration Summer Camp, where your kids can learn what it takes to become a pilot. That's coming up in June as well. So be sure to head over to www.pimaair.org to find out all the latest and check them out because it is the most incredible collection of aircraft in the world. And most of the things we cover, one of the examples is there. So head over there to check it out. Now, my first question to Caroline when we got together last week was quite a simple one. After looking at two huge maritime stories in endurance and bounty, what drew her to an aviation tale? Just a note to say that this episode was recorded as audio only, so the video that follows will be a slideshow of images from the CBI and Flying the Hump specifically. Hope you enjoy it. After two maritime adventures, you, and you can't get much bigger than the bounty and endurance with Captain Bly and, and old Shackleton, what brought you to the hump? What brought you to a story of aviation? How, how, how did you decide to make that shift over? Well, I really stumbled on the story. Um, it, this did not come about through reading or researching or any kind of channel like that. I was on an assignment for National Geographic magazine uh, on a big story about tigers, some, gosh, 2010, I believe it was. And one of the sites of interest for that story was this uh, extraordinary place in northern Myanmar or Burma, as it's sometimes called and was called mm -hmm. during the era we're, we're interested in, the, called the Hukong Valley, which is a, a spectacular area of jungle wilderness ringed by mountains, a very, very beautiful place in time of peace and unknown to me, a very terrible place in, in time of war. And it's very uh, little in either inhabited or frequented. And I was struck in looking at some of the scattering of villages by the Naga people that their, uh, their houses were built of bamboo and thatch, but they had metal fencing around their vegetable plots uh, made of jagged metal. And so I, I remarked on this and I was told that it had been cut from the fuselages of U.S cargo planes crashed nearby in the jungle. And that caught my attention. And I, uh, when I came back to the States, I sort of looked into it and was stunned to then learn about this entire aerial operation and the degree of, uh, first of all, there's still about an estimated 600 uh, or so crashed cargo planes still uh, un salvaged, undiscovered, lying along the route that this uh, this transport mission had flown, which went from northeast India across the Burma jungle, this northern part of Burma, to southwest China. And so scattered under that route is the debris of the crashed aircraft. And that got me into the story. 
it it had in fact frankly been my original intention to follow there there are these uh, missions that are undertaken by an arm of the US military to go and look for the remains of every downed american soldier anywhere mm -hmm. in the world and i had been on one of these earlier in vietnam and i had thought that might be the backbone of the story you know looking for this particular downed aircraft but it never happened never happened and i think fortunately so because this compelled me to look at dig deeper into the source material which is incredibly rich for this subject so that's how it came about that must have been an incredible trip it, it it's it's a country that has has been so so closed off for so long but being able to to get up there and, and and see that quite untouched part of the world must have been quite extraordinary it's a remark i mean it's a magnificent place absolutely mm -hmm. memorable and um again uh, later in when i was embarking on the story sort of forthrightly i interviewed an elderly gentleman who had been one of the chindits one of the special operations mm -hmm. ground forces in this uh, very chaotic and messy series of campaigns and he of course had known the hukong valley in a very different way as a place of great hardship and even terror and you know when i asked him i said what when i say the words burma what what comes to your mind and he said i'm soaking wet in the monsoon rain and you know just uh living in the rain and in the mud and the leeches and the insects and the diseases and these you know privation and so on whereas years passed decades passed and now it in a day of glorious sunshine i thought it was one of the most magical places i'd ever been so um i think it's just that you know i was incredibly lucky to go in there and it it's still very difficult to get into because of um the kachin independence army is fighting in that area and pretty much everyone's sort of off limits now yeah. so for those people who I've never heard of this before. And I was surprised when I said I was reading your book, how many people did say, what's that? Because as a plain nut, the hump is one of those great stories. If you've read Ernest Grand's book, you know, he, he doesn't do it, but he gets close enough to go, I'm not getting anywhere near that. So what was the hump? Let's, let's set the scene. Why were the air transport command flying ridiculous missions over the, the Himalayas into China? Well, it begins, it's um, perhaps safer to say this begins with the blockade of nationalist China. Mm -hmm. So this, of course, happens some years ahead of the entry of the U.S. into the war. But by the time that um, the Japanese had sort of made incursions into China piecemeal and at some point blockaded all of the coast, which was the primary area through which China got supplies. And had then China had then been re relying on a very tenuous land route, the famous Burma Road, which led by bits and pieces by land and rail from Rangoon um, up to a sort of railhead and then on a very muddy, uh, hard scrabble built road through very formidable terrain to Kunming in southwest China. And this was the kind of existing artery. It was also a place, it must be said, that was, um, although it was a kind, always anointed a lifeline, it was a very imperfect lifeline and used as much for black market traffic as, as genuinely bringing in kind of needed supplies. But at any rate, when the Japanese overrun Burma and take the Burma road, China is now facing a very real blockade. And the U.S. government, there were, first of all, there was enormous uh, attachment to China during this period um, amongst the American public. This had to do a great deal with the missionary efforts that uh, America had an enormous number of missionaries in the field throughout the decades in China and a remarkable number of, um, I'd say, Chinese-speaking Americans or, or Americans with through churches and communities felt a, uh, an actual personal relationship with the country, which is not typical of, you know, virtually many other parts of the world. So this had a high profile uh, appeal, if you will. And the Roosevelt government 
decided, really looking over the horizon of when the dust would settle from the looming war for the other allies and for China's situation. And Roosevelt envisioned a united China leaning towards being democratic, possibly even Christian, held together by Chiang Kai-shek, the uh, nationalist Kuomintang um, leader. And he wasn't so interested in military blows or cut and thrust as much as the big picture. And the big picture was he wanted China friendly to the US. And the best way to secure that was to show an act acts of goodwill. And this, by the way, comes from memos that were written. This isn't uh, just me using sort of glib language, where memos was sort of said, the best thing we can do is to show acts of friendship, speak well about China, um, have stories coming out of Washington that are respectful of China. And the idea of supplying blockaded China floats out of this intent as a kind of symbolic mission. So ironically, really, the hump began without a military purpose so much as a political purpose. It would be a very visible, ongoing symbol of goodwill of America for China. And the only problem was that it was a much more difficult uh, gesture than had perhaps originally been envisioned. So it, it's a very sort of Roosevelt-esque sort of attempt at soft power, isn't it? To, to try to in, in influence a region and uh, maintain that sort of control of it from the, the US sphere. It's something that he didn't like the word empire, but he was very good at attempting to build them in other ways. It, exactly, exactly. And and I, it's clear that what he envisioned, and he speaks very directly of the uh, collapse of the European powers in the with their various colonies in the East, um, and in particular that of Britain, and he speaks very openly to Chiang Kai-shek about the need for China to be, you know, one of the sort of policemen of the world during this post-war period. And it's clear he envisioned uh, China as a strong ally of the United States, mentored, I would say, by the United States um, into being kind of in lockstep with with them. And so um, one of the things worth remarking on at this point, however, is that because of this strong connection that America had with China, there was very good, very, very sound information coming into the administration about the actual state of affairs in China and Chiang Kai-shek himself and his form of government and how strong it was. And those reports were very dire and very bleak almost from the very beginning. And they came in at every level, which should have indicated some degree of caution that things (laughs) might not work out according to this lovely script. But it was a sort of case of optimistic determination that impelled this belief, you know, we'll give these supplies, China will be grateful and all will work out. Because Chiang Kai-shek was very much not the man that America wanted, but he was the one that they had. So they were going to su- support him to help. He's a very odd character, as as is his wife. And I, I use odd as in fascinatingly odd yeah. In, yeah. In, in, in that way. When you were researching him, what sort of jumped out and and madam chang as as well who very famously gave that speech in congress which is uh, has been used many, many times in many films what was your sort of take on him because he's a sort of central thread throughout the book with his his demands and his sort of conflicting conflicting views as he was very much sort of containing the japanese but keeping a, a more wary eye on 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 mao and the communists in the north I think what jumped out at me was the degree to which it was evident from without, and first of all, let me say, without digging into research, without doing anything that I could credit as being original research, but just looking at the documentation of the time, which came from State Department and other observers, which came from the minutes of some of the great summit meetings, which came from all the early biographies and statements of him, 
what is striking is the degree to which he was already losing China from the very beginning. Um, I can see no scenario in which um, China would have survived under his situ the situation with him being the single leader. It was imploding socially, economically, politically, let alone militarily. And a great part of Chiang Kai-shek's power at this point, he had sort of won an uneasy kind of power by being emerging as the kind of leading warlord of the era. But I would say that at this point, his most clear manifestation of power was the American support. Hmm. And that was what was keeping other warlords and people sort of warily at bay, biding their time perhaps for, you know, when he would weaken. But the reports coming out of the treatment of the people, the state of the people, the state of the economy, a kind of either cluelessness or indifference to the, the basic elements of, 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 of leadership of a country as opposed to military overlordship seem to just either elude him or, or he just didn't believe that they mattered, that I he seemed to believe if he just hunkered down, waited this out, and then could fight the communists, if he beat them, he would be the Lord of China. Mm -hmm. And he didn't realize that all these other aspects that were not of interest to him were in the meantime shifting, reshaping his country and and really kind of making his form of leadership obsolete. It's such an interesting period of time with what's going on in you know i think of um there's there, there's other sort of wider books in the period you know, on the shelf i've got um, richard overy's blood and ruins which is sort of that whole sort of 20 year period he, he he looks at of all the powers in that region and in the middle of it there's always there's always chang and there's always him trying very badly to play all sides against each other and at the same time yeah, <laughs> squirrel away a lot of money and a, a lot of nice things. It, it sort of all f it starts falling apart really when the Japanese burst south and 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 west from from their their bases in China and, and after the attack on Pearl Harbor, racing down into Singapore. That sort of changes that dynamic, and that's when we start seeing U.S. involvement and then this question of supply and. You know, you, you very vividly capture the sort of chaos of of the Japanese advance and the the retreat from it to the civilians as well. I guess you were having to choose various stories to just tell how desperate a situation that was because it's it's a not easy section of your book to read because there's a, a lot of very innocent people being caught up and many many of them dying, on, especially on the road trying to trying to get to India away from the advance. The, that exodus from Burma is one of the, uh, I mean, extraordinary in the, in the worst sense of the word, chapters of this whole story. I believe that at the time, that was one of the sort of, in terms of numbers, greatest sort of civilian uh, refugee migrations. I mean, apart from within China, where the numbers from the various shifts and changes have been so vast. But what, what had happened was that there was a very large Indian population within Burma. And this was in turn a factor of Burma having been an originally attached to India as a British colony before it got a kind of quasi-independence as, as its own colony. And a number of, a, an enormous number of Indian citizens had come in to work at every level from being uh, sort of day laborers um, to being the you know, military police and clerks. And there was a very long acquaintance between the Indians and the British in terms of working together with bureaucracies. It was something that Indian citizens uh, trained in and knew, and therefore this was a new place to come and work. But the end result was that in a population at that era, Burma had about 15 million people. There were a million Indian immigrants and they were very much resented by the, by the Burmese population because they had got the wage earning, highest wage earning jobs. 
And it was said famously that on the streets of Rangoon, one heard Hindustani, not English and not certainly not Burmese, most commonly. So when the Japanese come in, sweep in to claim Burma, overrun Burma, the Burma, Burmese sub, subjects and citizens are very unclear about are these really bad events? Possibly this is going to be liberating them from British rule. So they were very ambivalent and, uh, initially, and, and J the J Japanese took great pains initially to imply that they were kind of benevolent liberators and so forth. So what this meant was that you had the Burmese population edging towards the support of the Japanese invaders on the one hand, and now a great fear that this minority population of Indians suddenly realized we are not in our own native land. And all the resentments that had been brewing there and a manifested number of ugly race riots over the years between the Burmese and the Indians really came to the fore. And the Indians felt we have to get out of this country. And so you have this extraordinary situation where virtually everybody, whether they're Indian or Anglo or Anglo-Burman or Anglo-Indian, anybody who isn't truly Burman wants to flee from, from Burma. And so first, this is managed by going, you know, short overland trips to seaports, then as those close down, longer overland uh, treks, and then finally, most dreadfully, the, the worst overland trek, which was up through this Hukong Valley, um, just very, very difficult terrain. And the stories of thousands, unnumbered thousands, still not really known thousands, tens of thousands, of families, um, you know, women in saris um, and babies and old people trundling through the mud and then the monsoon comes and now they're slogging hours and hours a day to try and find their way out over the mountain passes, um, hours a day and advancing maybe a couple of miles on a hundred mile trek. So it becomes known as the refugee trail. And when in after some years had passed and it becomes the site of a military operation, the bones of this trail, of the bones along the trail of the refugees are all too visible. You could literally just walk and, and people were saying that within the space of a mile or so, you were coming upon five, six, seven sets of skeletons. So a, a dreadful period of history. It, it's, it is absolutely heartbreaking and, and it sort of brings, sets the scene in, in, in your book for what is about to come, that sort of knowing that that road is now shut and the air route is the only way in. And we're going to get to the aviation bit now, I think, because there's <laughs> <'cause laughs> any listeners are saying, well, this is an aviation podcast. Why haven't we talked about planes? We're talking about refugees and geopolitics in China. Well, we will in a second because there's a, there's a couple chaps we have to talk about because – You've got the wonderful Joseph Stilwell, Vinegar Joe, who much like Patton kept a very colorful diary, didn't he? So that, that must, he adds a lot of flavor to the, the book with his observations going through. Who, who was Stilwell? Because he, he was in charge for a, a great period of, the, of this operation. So Stilwell is a, a tragic figure, um, ultimately. He was the ranking uh, Office, U.S. officer in in the China Burma India theater, and he began by being brought in with a very thankless job, which was essentially to be the li liaison uh, with Chiang Kai Shek between the U.S. and the Chinese um, on the one hand, and then he had another job, which was to sort of oversee the lend lease supplies that were being brought into China, much coveted by Chiang Kai Shek. And then finally, he was intended to be sort of the commander of any U.S. forces in China, of which at this early stage were really very, very few. But it was this military, it was the latter uh, hat, if you will, that he most coveted. He was a career officer trained at West Point, and through no fault of his own, 
just given the geopolitics of the time, had never actually been in combat. He had been an observer during World War I. But one of the curious things about him is if you read any of the biographies that come out immediately after the war, they'll always talk about him as being America's finest, one of his finest field commanders. And it's an extraordinary statement because he, he was at this point after uh, he was like amongst the other allies, run out of Burma uh, after a period of a couple of months no, through no fault of his own. It was a losing campaign. But that at that moment in May of 1942 represented the entirety of his combat experience and the entirety of his experience of leadership in combat, perhaps more importantly. And he was now 60 years of age. And the end of his career was f approaching. And one of the more unpleasant dynamics is the degree to which he seeks what the British regarded as a completely pointless campaign, which was this campaign through northern Burma to cover the building of what would be a second overland road to China that was meant to compensate for the loss of the Burma road. And this is the famous Lido Road, which had been studied by the British and they absolutely correctly forecast that it would never function <laughs> in time to be of any use to the war and even then would never ever meet what air supply could do. It was really a pointless task, but a driving element in this was Stilwell's own ambition. He is, his diaries are a gift to any writer. They are, people say caustic, but they're, they're often searing. They're funny. He's a very acute observer. He's got a wonderful turn of phrase. He leaps to life on the page. Um, the only thing to advise is that the published account of his diaries has been highly expurgated. And when one reads the diaries in the raw, which you can do on the um, Hoover Institute website where the diaries are housed, one realizes the degree of malice behind these so-called caustic or pungent mm -hmm. comments. And then there's a point where there were times where I almost felt as if I was reading the kind of writings of a, a grieved teenager. I, I know that sounds a, a, a very cruel thing to say, but when we have things like uh, troubled youths, you know, and do something dreadful, and then afterwards people go and look at the kinds of things that they had been writing, there is a degree of instability in the toxicity with which he regards people who are meant to be his allies. It's not just that he has mostly negative things to say about everybody. It's that they infiltrate every level of his thinking in a way that just doesn't seem dignified for a commander of forces, let alone one working with both Chinese and American and British allies. So there's an instability about him. One um, memoirist of this campaign, John Masters, um, writes that when you read the diaries, it betrayed an insecurity complex of terrifying order. And I think that's a very good encapsulation. So this is the person who's both um, courageous, energetic, wants to fight in the most noble way, if you will, wants glory. And I don't mean that cynically. I mean, for a career officer, that's what he yearned for. But history is passing him by, and this is his last shot. And without the ability or, or experience in commanding men, when he finally had the chance to do this, he did a very poor job indeed. Because he, he was also trying, I say trying, I do air quotes, there we go. Um, to work with Harold Alexander, who was kind of chief British forces in the Indian Army. You've got uh, Bill Slim as well, who in a few years will make his name in, in northern India with the, the incredible battles at Kohima and Imphal. He doesn't work well with others, does he, still well? And that probably was not the right command for someone of, of his temperament when he's got a lot of politics and a lot of British history in the area, which makes them a little bit stick in the muddy to to, <laughs> to try and try to be polite about it. 
he didn't work well with anybody except a very close cadre of of a circle that he kept around him, which included, by the way, uh, his son and his two sons-in-laws and a kind of group of uh, guys who just love sort of the adventure of being around Joe Stilwell, but but their own... The, the comments from the American command, from for, let's put aside the British, which were quite uh, blistering, um, but from the American command was that he he was secretive, he was furtive, he kept his uh, ideas to himself, he was not a team player, he did not communicate what he was doing, he was constantly doing sort of little end runs to score points. Um, it it just wasn't a healthy. It wasn't adult in an in an odd way, um, but I think the most telling point of him in a purely military aspect, or maybe uh, let me expand it in pure leadership aspect, mm-hmm. is a point that is made by both the British chindits, again the ground forces uh, or special uh, forces um, in the later Burma campaign and the marauders, which are the kind of American equivalent of the Chindits, um, both of which had the dreadful job of, you know, working behind the Japanese lines within the jungle, and both of which suffered very badly under Stilwell's command. And they, both writers from both sides point to a single incident that happened at the outset of what was known to be, going to be a very, very difficult, very dangerous, very taxing campaign. And this is when the marauders are marching out towards to enter into what will be an ongoing jungle offensive. And Stilwell's uh, headquarters at that time were only 100 yards away. And he he didn't think to come out to greet the soldiers. Mm -hmm. And this is pointed to by all of the other military people as just somebody who, as as a sign that he just didn't have whatever that takes to lead other men. He didn't understand that a commander's job is to go there for morale, to, to shake the hand, to salute as they pass, to even wisecrack as they go by. Uh, but he sort of hunkered down and they, the men just marched on without any kind of um, mm. greeting, knowing he was in the area, by the way. And this sort of set the tone that they really didn't count, that they were there for some inscrutable mission for his purposes, but in in some sense, he wasn't united to his men in any meaningful way. Which, for a commander with such a disparate group of men under his command, is is unforgivable almost. Because we you know we, we're going to sort of segue onto the men who actually flew the hump because they are an interesting group themselves. So you have initially the tenth air force, and then the air transport command, and they're sucking in people from all over the place. So people going through training, but also ex airline crews. That's why you have, um, you know, as we mentioned him before, Ernest Grand mentioning it in, in Fate as a Hunter. What were the experience of these men coming up? Because it's a, it's a vast array of either a newbie or guys with thousands of hours showing up in, in Northern India to fly this here to unknown routes to China. The, the most experienced were the, the, the sort of small corps at the very beginning that were the uh, CNAC or uh, Chinese National Aviation Corporation pilots, the, which was the joint um, American-Chinese, actually Chinese majority ownership uh, commercial airline. And they had many years, they were a very small operation, but they were very, very skilled, flying the terrain, dodging the Japanese, um, they didn't have direct experience at the hump, but they they had more experience than most of the other pilots that were being brought in to make this air supply. So one of the things we, first of all, we've just not talked about is the terrain, uh, mm. just to set the backdrop. Um, this route, which uh, led from... Um, which should have taken, in good, good weather, took about three and a half hours to fly. Um, from northeast India to southwest uh, China to in Yunnan province. Unfortunately, however, first of all, this route just happened to pass over the um, eastern end of the um, Himalayan foothills, 
which meant that there were very high peaks all around. You had to stick to the route to stay clear at about 15,000 feet. Doesn't sound much in today's t terms, but all around the route, visibly on a clear day, were peaks much higher than you were flying. So it was very necessary to stick to a course on the one hand. On the other hand, this also happened to go through one of the most roiling and malevolent weather systems on Earth, <laughs> which was a convergence of systems coming in from the Bay of Bengal and the South China Sea, and then with uh, other, you know, uh, dr low pressures and cold winds sweeping down from Tibet and Siberia. And all of these kind of converged in this cr almost chronic unstable air and then you had mountain uh, wave effects you know with terrific wind shears and so on and so forth and this is at an era when it's not yet known that there's something called the jet stream so the first thing is is that these pilots are flying in very difficult conditions very challenging conditions they're also flying without many navigational aids and in the original, uh, the early stage, they're flying with almost no ground navigational aids, which is, say, no radio stations, no, no beacons, nothing of this sort. And the part of the journey that was most feared was this traverse across that vast jungle of northern Burma. It was featureless. It was like flying over the ocean. And if you got blown off course, and let alone if you were in instrument conditions, you did not know where you were. And one of the major courses, causes of um, crashes was pilots just running out of fuel. They would just got lost and the fuel would run down and there they were. So these, these are the systems in which the pilots of whatever stripe are going to have to navigate. And Initially, there were the spirit core of experienced pilots, but as the war on the wider sense churns on, the, the so-called cream of the classes, the most skilled and most trained pilots are being sent to be uh, fighter pilots and bomber pilots. These are only transport pilots. You know, in the hierarchy of, of uh, respect, if you will, within aviation communities, in, particularly in this era, the transport pilot is not, you know, the, the by any means the, the highest ranking. They're not even combatants. So it was sort of thought that anybody would be good enough to fly supplies, you know, from one country to another. And you had, I actually interviewed one um, former pilot, and now uh, less deceased, um, but he described turning up to sea for the first time in his life, this, a C-46 aircraft that he was going to have to fly. And um, he describes how he and his co-pilot sort of figured out, you know, he laughed. He said, we figured out how to open the door. And then we got in and he said, we taxied back and forth studying the manual. And then they, mm -hmm. you know, took off. They, they actually flew to Calcutta and then from there on um, in, in steps over the hump. But you had people coming in with 25 hours of instrument training or instrument experience who were then expected to fly through one of these most uh, be on instruments almost from takeoff to landing at times over this very, very unforgiving terrain. And it, it, it's a period when your instruments are at best just pointing you in the rough, <laughs> roughly the correct this yes. is not not like we have now and it, it's interesting as well because i finished reading your book a few days before the um the incidents of turbulence the the singapore airlines flight and it, it struck me that what those poor passengers faced the other week and you know, sadly what one 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 chap was killed that was a regular occurrence when the weather hit over the hump wasn't it because when you mentioned wind shear yeah. and turbulence before we're talking about aircraft being flung vertically in over thousands and thousands of feet in something not as big and chunky as a 777. It, it, I was struck, and, and you probably oh. saw that it was in roughly the same mm. part of the world, yeah. and they, uh, the sort of news reporting that I've been reading says, you know, that it's the Bay of Bengal uh, produces these kind of unstable uh, systems. Um, the pilots of our era that we're talking about were flying further north where they had this, you know, 
also contended with the convergence of that system with other systems. But the incident that happened a few, you know, a week ago, whenever it was with Singapore Airlines lasted about a minute. And if you read the, uh, I think the analysis is that the plane lurched, uh, I think, up and down 400 feet. The hump pilots are reporting lurches up and down 4,000, 4,000 feet. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and enduring it for hours and hours and hours. And also all the icing conditions that happen, which would frequently knock out one engine or another, particularly on the C-46. And then all the navigational questions of, you know, these fierce winds and wind shears that suddenly in the midst of all of this, you're trying to keep track of where you actually might be. But it's it's true that the, the headline of just a short while ago was a little jolt um, to sort of channel, try and touch base with what these other pirate pilots um, felt of in, in, you know, flying the hump in, in that era, just a kind of taste of the terror of that experience. And, and it's an interesting mix of aircraft. You have the, the classic C-47 Skytrain, the Dakotas, as we would code, call this over here, that sort of workhorse DC-3 doing a lot of the work. The C-46, which we've mentioned on this podcast in the past as being okay as long as nobody's shooting at it, and then it had a nasty habit of just becoming a blowtorch, but b able to carry a lot of stuff, which makes it perfect for the hump. And then you've got uh, C-54s later on, you've got C-87s, which is the, the cargo version of the Liberator and, and things. Was it hard to sort of distill down and not getting lost in the the geekery of all the airplanes to try to do it because it's the volume we're talking about. I think the, um, what was the target that they wanted it was 10,000 tons a month, wasn't it? So yeah. for, for you as a writer coming to this, was it a case of mentioning the types and then sticking to the men who were trying to fly the types as opposed to having to sort of describe many, many, many different types of aircraft because they were using whatever could meet the tonnage and throwing it over the hump. This is an interesting question, this question of the balance of the uh, intricate knowledge, aviation knowledge. I, I wanted it to pass muster with any pilot who read. I make no pretense whatsoever that I have any aviation experience or any desire or, or the temperament to do so. I had one great asset, which is that my partner is a former U.S. Navy combat pilot, uh, carrier base who flew low-level reconnaissance over North Vietnam and still flies. His reward to himself for surviving is that he now has a Lancer Evolution, which is a kit-built plane, mm -hmm. and we fly regularly in it. So I fly in the right seat. But I know the experience has not made me more comfortable with flying, it has made me more aware of how much you have to know to be a good pilot. Mm -hmm. And I was keenly aware of how little someone like me actually knows. And I was keenly aware that I wanted pilots almost out of respect for their craft to, I wanted to pass muster with with the masters of this skill. Mm -hmm. I didn't want them to say, oh, this was a great story, but Alexander, you know, didn't know one end of an aircraft from another, and it's too bad, it's really spoiled the story. So I wanted it to, to be professional at that level, but I also wanted this book for the general audience, for mm -hmm. people like me who are not pilots nor want to be, but want to feel they're in the hands of someone who's telling the story properly, but not get down in the kind of uh, minute, you know, some of the, there are many, many memoirs, some of them just short reminiscences by hump pilots, you know, and I didn't want to get down into the, uh, you know, well, I, you know, the uh, prop governor was uh, malfunctioning. And so I changed the RPMs and angled, you know, it, it, that kind of level would distract from the bigger story. So I, was very careful to make sure I understood any terminology that came up, 
to under to run by poor my poor partner, you know, at dinner, I would often say, you know, well, tell me, you know, what, what, you know, how does this work? Tell me how you would feather a prop back on those days, and so um, that was an asset. But I felt I needed to know that academically, but. I never wished to pretend that I knew it practically. <laughs> so it was a balance of trying to keep the, the story, the human story of the pilot's experience to the fore, which is, I think, what you had asked earlier about, you know, or mentioned the Shackleton and Bly stories and so on. Those are all stories about human heroism, human endeavor, uh, endeavors a great against great odds mm -hmm. and i think that's the part that appeals to me and so this was a very unusual application of that in that it was a not a one-off venture like shackleton or bligh you know the one great boat journey the, um, the one against all odds this was a continuing cycle of extraordinary stories but so that it became routine but nonetheless what appealed to me, what I felt what the pull was, was the human experience of the men in the cockpits or the men, even the air crew who were, you know, accompanying radio operators and so forth. And so that's what I focused in, but tried to do my homework on the, uh, I guess you'd say, geeky stuff. Hmm. Rivet counting, I think, is, is a technical, <laughs> technical term. <laughs> yes, and I, I completely agree. You know, as, as wonderful as, as ships are or as aircraft are, they don't come alive until you put people in them. And then that's when they go from the inanimate to the animate. And that's when things get interesting. And the stories that you, 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 you relate in the, in the book are, are just harrowing at times. And the, you know, the, the, the tales of icing just are terrifying. And it's, you know, have, having flight planned aircraft, modern aircraft to stay away from severe icing conditions to know you don't really have a lot of choice because you've got, yeah. yeah, peaks going ten thousand feet higher than you either side. It was yes, made made me swallow and be glad I I, I was sitting nice and warm next to the fire here in, in in Horsham. But for those pilots, what did they have to do to rotate home? Because it, it's a similar sort of figure as a mission count in in Northwest Europe, or as they would do later in the Pacific. But for for these guys as well, they have that same magic target what was it? Because it wasn't a case of you're here till the duration as the ground crews would be. What was their target? What was the dream number for them? It it changed. It it originally was um, set at, well, it, it, actually the, the debate about this internally is fascinating to follow because mm -hmm. you had initially one of the uh, commanding uh, commanders of the uh, operation, the air transport command operation, uh, a general Hardin saying, you know, it should be a thousand hours of flight and then they get to go home. And then you actually had the surgeon general chip in and say, that can't happen. That's way too much. So he uh, sort of grumpily settled on 650 hours, but there was no time limit put on it. And this was very dangerous because what it meant was that pilots were so desperate to get home. We also haven't mentioned the living conditions mm. that they were in, which were very, very basic at both ends, in both India and in China. Very unpleasant and, and very basic and uh, monsoon weather and uh, everything else. So people wanted to go home absolutely as fast as they could. And this meant that what you would have um, were senior pilots pouring on the hours to rack them up in order to get out and they had a system whereby the junior pilots would fly in the right seat with the senior pilots. And that was how they learned the route essentially. But the idea was they were meant to occasionally share, you know, get some sort of sense of, of flying as well. But the system was therefore faulty for, for two reasons. One, it meant that people, the senior pilots were flying way too hard and this was thought to contribute to the fatigue and the accidents and just a kind of recklessness because they tried to, if they could cram 650 hours within five months, they would do it. But then when they left, you were left with junior pilots who'd actually never taken, been allowed mm -hmm. to 
do the flying. And so it was uh, the rule was changed quite late in the day, but in uh, September of 1944, you have General William Tunner come in, who's really the person who I'd say professionalizes the whole hump operation. And he extends the hours, but requires that the time be extended as well. So by the time the hump sort of ends, it took 750, you had to have 750 hours of flying within at least a year of time. And so it meant a few more, it meant more hours, but it also meant that those were paced in a way that was much safer. And indeed the safety record reflects that. Which is interesting because that's round about what max hours are for an airline pilot today. It's, it's in the same sort of ballpark, which I found quite interesting. It's, you know, we, I, had, I have so many questions, Caroline, and I, I do not want this pe- to spoil the book for people because it's, it's there and it is out now at all good and evil bookshops. So choose wisely where you buy it from. Support your local indie, as always, dear listener. The... One bit that I I did want to touch on as we start to wrap up was you have some fantastic tales in the book of crews who had to bail out, um, including journalists. But we'll save that one for the book because he got enough publicity at the time. (laughs) But those tales are interesting, especially the, the rescue operations as the operation went on to ensure that these valuable crews were being able to be picked up. We talked about the lost figures before, but... There was a lot of effort put in to save the crews who went down over the hump, wasn't there? there it emerged slowly. It mm. wasn't, I mean, and but it has to be said this whole operation was such a novelty that everything was kind of by trial and error and lurched forward. But initially it was um, the search and rescue were, were done really by ground forces that there, there was one, the precursor of the CIA, the OSS had an early team in there without any clear mission, by the way, and they were felt that they needed an aircraft to do what they were meant to do, which was get behind Japanese lines, but there were no aircraft. So they volunteered. They said, look, if you give us a plane to the Air Transport Command, we'll help look for your downed airmen. Um, and so it's started sort of very amateur, very ad hoc uh, first search like that. Then um, there was the uh, famous incident with a journalist, as you mentioned, which captured everybody's attention, even stateside, because he was a known name, um, where 21 people had to bail out of a C-46 on a clear day, by the way. Uh, The aircraft had engine failure and the plane just couldn't sustain altitude and everybody had to jump. And these were civilians who, you know, had no training whatsoever. And so that captured attention. After that, the efforts start to become, you know, more concerted. And you had um, very movingly, the first group really were volunteers within the air forces who wanted to save their buddies and volunteered to do very difficult um, search and rescue type operations, uh, jumping into the jungle to look for ground crews, some very difficult kind of extraction missions with light aircraft and so on. But after the mass jumping, there's a dedicated search and rescue branch that was very good for morale as well as being a practical use, but it just was very comforting to people to know that somebody, one of their their compatriots would be out looking for them. But I have to say one of the extraordinary statistics or, or facts to come out of this sort of whole search and rescue chapter is that there was a very diligent effort made to map each known crash site so that they wouldn't keep getting reinvestigated and, you know, retreading old ground and wasting time, as it were. But the number of of unknown crashes is extraordinary. In other words, individual aircraft had not been tracked and counted, which one would have thought was completely basic. And so even though people were able to say, all right, so-and-so never came back from his mission. Um, Somehow all this data never quite got consolidated. 
And at the end of the war, there was still question as to how many aircraft actually crashed, how many men actually died. The statistics, the, the estimate ranges from something like 1,700 fatalities to 3,600 or so. That's a huge dis disparity. And it really came because nobody was keeping track during the first period of this operation. Which is remarkable. You can you can sort of play in the, that sort of fog of war element to it as, as as well, those those desperate early days. But it does achieve a lot because by the end of it, you have the hump supplying everything needed for the 20th Bomber Command flying B-29s against Japan before they then shifted out towards Formosa and, and joining up with the 20. First, it is a remarkable achievement what was flown over, over the hump. And your book your book tells a very wide tale for it. And it was, I like I said at the outset, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. What's your lasting memories of this project now that it's out in the wild and, and you've you've escaped it and your your poor other half doesn't have to be pestered over dinner about flying flying questions. What, what what's your what's the thing that sort of stays stays with you now as you look back on this project? There there are two things. One I would say is is sort of abstract or uh, perhaps uh, historical academic. What what is astounding to me to have marched through all the stages of this operation is the discrepancy between the intelligence hmm. that the United States had and the and then not acting on that. Whether it was assessing Chiang Kai Shek, whether it was assessing the danger of the route, which in the very beginning had been surveyed very closely and carefully, it it just seemed like nobody ever metabolized the information that was broad. And it I carry that forward into the 21st century and just think, you know, if, if people were more rational, politicians were more rational and were made to sit and digest the information that had been, intelligence had been given to them and then act on it as opposed to on optimism or ideology, you know, the world might, you know, might be a bit safer. But on the more visceral sense, I think one of the scenes that haunts me, and there are many, many, many in this book, so I'm grabbing at the one that floats to my mind at this mm -hmm. moment. There's a remarkable story of a bailout at night. Um, I believe it's from a C-46. It's from a padre who well, he was a chaplain, an army chaplain, and he felt that he needed to experience the hump in order to be able to talk to his flock. And so he chooses a night. It's an unproblematic. It's actually full moon. It's a very beautiful flight. And he describes sort of dozing out and watching, enjoying the scenery pass beneath him, these snowy glittering peaks, they arrive in China, then they set off for India within about an hour turnaround. And then at that point, he becomes aware that they should be landing in India and they're not. And he looks ahead, he pokes his head around, he's in a passenger seat and sees the huddled heads of the pilot and co-pilot and navigator in the light of the cockpit and then doesn't think much of it and starts dozing and then is woken up by the crew chief coming back to him and saying, Padre, it seems we are plenty lost. And he just can't wrap his brain around this. The aircraft is flying. The, and and then he says, uh, the crew chief says, let's get you, get you suited into a, get you, you know, into a shoot, Padre. And he's, the, the father says, it isn't rational. It isn't rational. The plane is flying. But what the crew know is that they're running out of gas and that the plane is doomed and it's going to crash somewhere into the Burma jungle. And so there's this surreal scene of this man. I actually picture him, whether he was or not, I picture him sort of like a priest frock, you know, standing, <laughs> being strapped, bundled into a parachute. And then the door opens and the cold night air comes in and he sees little wisps of clouds below. And he's, they say, this is it. The aircraft lurches and he realizes it really is going to go down and out he jumps into the into the night, you know. So that kind of 
that story sticks with me, perhaps because it is a civilian with no experience, mm. and I can so imagine myself in that situation. Yes, that oh, a night parachute jump when you know there's nothing but jungle and very inhospitable jungle below you is no, no, I wouldn't like that. Yeah, that was that's, that's a great tale. Um, thank you so much for spending a bit of time with us. Did you want to? Tell us all the title of the book one, one more time and we can we can hear you. Give us the pitch for it. <laughs> well, it's called Skies of Thunder. And um, it, the subtitle is The Deadly World War II Mission Over the Roof of the World. It's published by Viking. Who very kindly sent me a, a nice early copy, which was very kind of them. So thank, thank you very much. And if you're listening, um, Viking people who have also sent me another new one as well, which is also very <laughs> exciting. But that's, that's, for, that's for another show. Caroline, thank you so much for joining us. This has been a delight. Thank you for the book. And I'm um, excited for whatever you have coming next. Don't know what that is, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, all the best. I cannot thank Caroline Alexander enough and the team at Penguin Viking for sending over this review copy of Skies of Thunder. I thoroughly enjoyed the book. The focus switches as the book goes on into more different elements, especially with Meryl's Marauders and the Chindits. So it does cover a huge swathe of that period in the CBI. The book is out now from, as we said, from all good and evil bookshops. Support your local indie. Check out the Damcasters bookshop if you're here in the UK and you fancy supporting the pod as well. Of course, if you like the, what you heard, like, subscribe, leave us a review, pop some stars into whatever app you're using. And that all helps the pod hugely. And I can't thank everybody enough for their continued support. If you want these episodes early and an audio version that has different wafflings from me at the beginning, then check out our Patreon as well, where you can become a Dan Kastir for just three pounds a month plus a bit of that. And we delve into all things AV geekery and more. And over the summer, we're going to try a few different things as well, but be sure to check that out on the link in the description for more. I can't thank Caroline enough for spending an afternoon with me here on the Damcasters. Do check the book out. It is very interesting. Some of the tales that she finds in it are quite something. There's lots of post-its in the book as well to go back to find them. Thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you for your continued support. And as always, do take care of yourselves. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone and is a Bony Abroad podcast production. To learn more about our podcast and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamcasterspod.com.